no fear Cause I believe There is no doubt Cause I have seen Your faithfulness My fortress Over and over I found a In your name Over and over
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. I see myself in need every day that I live. More in need of him. Need more of his glory. More of his power. More of his spirit to be made alive within my life as an individual. Amen. I'd like for us to go to the Lord in prayer, being mindful of them that are not here. Just continue to pray about this pandemic situation there's a great deal of conflict and and all that that is transpiring nationwide and uh what we need is unity we need unity within the church within our families within this nation amen so let's pray and pray for a spirit of unity like we've never had before like for us to remember linda's sister libby's sister in prayer She's, uh, you know, she's had some surgery done. There are still signs of cancer there, and they're going to begin radiation treatment. We want the Lord to heal her, amen, in Jesus' name. Let's also continue to pray for Beverly Knight. Let's pray for Mamma Forsyth. She has been sick. She's doing better, but we want to continue to keep her lifted up in prayer. Let's pray for all and everyone that have been some way affected by the shutdown monetarily physically mentally spiritually i can assure you there's a great deal of problems that develop as a result of of not knowing where your next dollar's coming from and, and at times not knowing where your next meal may come from amen i'd like for us to remember humanity as a whole amen there's not there's not the black race, there's not the white race, there's not the brown race, there's the human race. Exactly. And the whole human race is being affected by what has taken place. So let's be mindful of all, all these needs tonight. If you have a need, just let it be known by the uplifting of your hand. The Lord knows up and about that need. And uh, with our hands lifted, shall we go to the Lord in prayer, remembering this service tonight as well. Gracious God. We say thank you, Lord, again for the opportunity that we have been given and be able to, to come and lift our voices and our hands to you in both prayer and praise. God, we come petitioning you with thanksgiving, knowing, Lord, that you will minister and minister well to every need according to your will. Amen. And according to your riches and glory. God, I trust Jesus. Amen, that the power of your spirit will continue to minister, manifesting itself in hearts and lives. Amen, within the church and abroad. We pray, Lord, for the entire human race. Pray, Lord, for a spirit of unity. Amen, to bind us together as a people, all to be bound together. Amen. Lord, with a spirit of love and compassion, I pray, Lord, that you will bind us together as a family, as a church family, that you will bind this nation together in unity, amen, as you see the number of people who will attempt, amen, to tear down as opposed to build up. God, I pray that, amen, there will be the building up of many spirits today, amen, as a result of of a fervent prayer that's offered up in their stead. Pray, Lord, I trust the effectual fervent prayer and that many will feel the, the effects, dear Lord, of such prayer tonight. In Jesus' name, pray for Linda. Pray for Mamma Forsyth. Pray for Beverly Knight. Pray, Lord, for numerous others who have been sick in body. Amen, that you will not only heal them physically, but that they will be healed spiritually. Lord, you see and you know of the amount of people, amen, who are suffering spiritually, mentally, and physically today as a result uh, of what has taken place. We come against every spirit of fear, every force of darkness and adversity that will attempt to wreak havoc of the lives of many, Lord, whose quest and search for you is one of great diligence who long, dear Lord, to be baptized with your spirit. 
God, I'm asking it all to be done in your name. That lovely name, Jesus. Amen. And we're believing it to be done as we're careful to give you praise and glory. Amen. And not honoring you through that of a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. And with our voices lifted unto you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Look to your neighbor, smile at them, and say, what a joy it is to see you in service this Wednesday evening. Amen. We may be sparse in number, amen, but God doesn't necessarily move just with numbers nor limited by numbers, amen. So let's continue to worship the Lord in song, lifting our voice, magnifying him, amen. How many of you come to praise him tonight? All right, let's continue to worship him, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
reach out to that one. Amen. Within whom lies our healing. <laughs> Within whom we find founda a foundation. Within whom we find salvation. Hallelujah. It's in Jesus. He is the one. Hallelujah. Heal that body, Lord. Deliver that soul, Lord. Deliver that mind that's being tormented. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Ha. Glory to your precious name. Amen. Within him lies all power. And we find to where that all things are found to be subject to him. Principalities, powers, everything there be thrones, dominions, and all things were created by him and for him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Amen. I'm, my soul is still in the making process. And God has delivered me from, and he's still delivering me from. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to take up our evening offering. Let's give and give as unto the Lord here tonight. In Jesus' name, we're well, the offering plates will remain up here as we have been asked to do to follow the protocol of, of our uh, curse that's going around. <laughs> Amen. Let's give and give as unto the Lord in Jesus' name. And it will say in Jesus' name. It's the only way to give. And let's continue to worship the Lord here in song tonight. Yes, yes, yes. In my moments of fear, through every pain and every tear, there's a God who's been faithful to me. When my strength all gone when my heart had no song still in love he proved faithful to me and every word he's promised is true
Hallelujah. Great is your faithfulness to us, oh God. Hallelujah. Great is your faithfulness to us, oh God. Hallelujah. No matter how far we may go or where we may be, you are faithful to reach down and lift us up. You are faithful to meet every need, to heal every disease, to touch our minds, to set the captives free. You are faithful, God. And you know right where we are. Great is your faithfulness. Hallelujah. Great is your faithfulness. Why don't we express our love Hallelujah. and our gratefulness here tonight, amen. Hallelujah. And direct it toward this loving God, amen, this faithful Savior, this one who cares. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Uh, thank you, Lord, for being there, for meeting every need. Thank you, Lord, for shelter. Thank you, Lord, for clothing. Thank you, Lord, for food. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the minute and trivial things of life, that which we label trivial, Lord, amen, but yet proved to be more and added blessing to our everyday living. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What a joy it is to be here on a Wednesday evening and to see each and every one of you that were able to come tonight and for all of you that were unable to come. We miss you not being here. I know that some of you may be watching, watching online. And uh, our hopes are is that you're blessed at home or wherever you may be, as well as we find ourselves blessed here, being within each other's company. Amen. Uh, there's, there is a, just an added blessing of being able to join ourselves together under one roof and to lift our voice unto one God. Amen. In the spirit of unity, and that be that of united praise. Hallelujah. Well, <clears throat> uh, these are certainly unprecedented times, and uh, there seems to be a great deal, as I've mentioned already, a great deal of conflict that's taking place in and around not just within our nation, but around our world. However, I want to be on the right side. I want to be on his side. Amen. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. I, uh, I've got a message, and I might add by way of the announcement that uh, we'll have different speakers for the weekend. And... <coughs> Brother Brandon and our Sunday School Evangelistical team will be out of pocket this Sunday. How many of you have been enjoying Brother Brandon and our Sunday School Evangelistical team? Amen. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy I overheard my parents speaking yesterday evening as well as my sister and how, how well that the adults enjoy. It's for all of us. Amen. And there is, there is a lesson to be learned with every, every puppet. Who not to pattern your life after it and who to pattern your life after it. Brother Brandon sent, I, th I believe it was Brother Brandon, either he or Sister Hillary one sent me a video clip of <coughs> Gabriel. And I got such a kick out of what I heard. And I, I, I told them last night, I would make reference to this. It goes to show you how close attention our children are really paying to what's going on up here on the platform. Amen. What? I don't have the right ticket? Yeah. 
Help me out, Gabriel. Yeah. <laughs> He said, oh, I've not got caught. <laughs> oh, mercy. It, it's, uh, it's amazing at what our children learn. And we certainly want for them to learn well and right. I want to take your attention to the word of the Lord reading from uh, the sixth chapter of the book of Second Samuel. first song we sang here tonight, I believe, very well reflects upon what I feel inclined to teach, preach, treat, whatever you would choose to call it. We'll begin with verse 2. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. Now notice, that bring up thence, or bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out, the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah, and Uzzah, not Ayo. The sons of Abinadab drove the new car, drove the new car. We'll say a new car. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was in Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And I, Ahio, went before the ark. David and all the house of Israel played with the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against him. God smote him there for his error. Now, one rendition of this word error reads like this, making reference to him being irreverent. Irreverent. And there he died by the ark of God. Verse 8, and David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day and David was afraid of the Lord that day and said how shall the ark of the Lord come to me how many of you want for the glory of God to prevail yes how shall the ark of the Lord come to me now David's really making this to be a personal thing now I'm going to tell you if there's anything that God wants to be with us it is a he is to be a personal God. Amen. So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, and the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Gracious God, I pray your blessings upon the remaining part of this service. Help us to be Sensitive to your spirit, sensitive, dear Lord, to the administering of your word, that we will apply your word, the principles of your word to our daily living, and that we will be compliant in such a way that we prove ourselves not irreverent, but reverent and respectful to you always. We ask it all to be done in your precious name, the lovely name of Jesus, and everyone say amen. Amen. God bless you as you're seated. I'm going to preach from this subject thought tonight, and that is honor that insults God. Or another added title, Brother James, you choose one of the two, okay? Mine eyes have seen the glory. Mine eyes have seen the glory. 
There is the national anthem for which that we sing here as a nation and oftentimes do so in our salute to the flag. However, there is another song that is quite common in and among every American-born citizen for the most part. Go ahead and turn the, this one on. There you go. The Battle Hymn of the Republic, which is also known as Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. How many of you know the words to that song? Some of us know the words. Some of us know a few words of that song. Now, there's a great deal of history that involves this song. I don't have a whole lot of time to cover the entire history concerning this song nor the lyrics of this song. But mine eyes have seen the glory is one which is outside of the United States, a lyric written by an abolitionist. It was a song that served as a tribute to all who longed to live free to live in freedom. We, during the time in which this song was written was during the time of the Civil War. And many of us know what the Civil War was fought for. And much of it was fought in seek, searching or in seeking to liberate or free all people within this country. And particularly people of which were labeled to be of color. They were slaves for the most part. And so there were a great number of people who sought to fight for the civil rights of every man and every woman alive. This woman that wrote the lyrics to the song was named Julia Ward Howe. She was an abolitionist. She was one who was a civil activist seeking to find all men and women freed and freed from slavery. Now, the music was a music to the lyrics of a song which was titled John Brown's Body. John Brown was also an abolitionist who was killed during this time, and there was, I believe, some question in regard to its lyrics, and so this dear soul, Julia, was called upon by a friend to write something good, write something good. And so we can read from the lyrics, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I am of the opinion and of the mindset to believe that the glory of God in its presence sets all humanity free. Amen. We heard the song from the very offset of this service here tonight. Send me more of your glory, more of your power, more of your spirit. The essence of all that meaning, I need more glory, I need more of your power, and I need more of your spirit. Why his spirit? For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. We find to where that freedom can be abused, however. We see to where that the apostle Paul wrote on one account that we are not to exercise our liberties as an occasion to the flesh. Amen. And that uh, also that, that the flesh is, seems to be the thing for which the spirit man struggles against the most. Peter, uh, Paul also said that, that all things are lawful but not all things are expedient. Not all things are suitable. There are just some things that, 
that are found to be inconducive, if you will, or not, not in any way compliant with the Spirit of the Lord for the most part. There are many ways for which seemingly godly men will seek and seek the glory of God or will hope to have it restored or returned to them. Unlike the initial outpour of God's Spirit, the latter rain will probably not be a sudden outpouring, but a rapid restoration. Now, I can't honestly state that the outpouring or the initial outpouring of, of the Holy Ghost was something that just suddenly took place. The Word of God does declare that suddenly. Amen. Now, this was after some days of fasting and praying. This was after some days of having spent and spent a great deal of their time of search and quest for the promise of God that was to be bestowed upon them in the upper room in the city of Jerusalem. But suddenly the word of God says that upon that, that day, the day of Pentecost, there came a sound like that of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. The first seemed to be sudden while the latter may be rapidly restored when we again see the need to honor him and honor his glory and honor him through prayer and honor him through devotion. One explanation or example of this can be found in scripture if we return to the time span that involves both Moses and that of King David as well. Moses built the tabernacle which represented divine order. Something for which God specifically orchestrated and ordered would be done. Then the glory of the Lord was revealed in a powerful way. It is sudden. The tabernacle seemed to have been suddenly engulfed in a thick cloud of God's glory. God's glory. Then with time the glory wanes with sin and with that of indifference. The waning continued until Israel had reached an all-time low under Eli's, the priest, leadership. And so much to where that the word of God declared the lamp of God was going out. And that Ichabod would be stamped upon the entire nation of Israel as a whole. Which means the glory of God hath departed. Eli and his sons then die. The ark of God or the glory of God is then captured. And brought to a city called Ashdod hand of God we see is against the Philistines. The hand of God we see in witness is against their false god Dagon. The Philistine god falls when the Ark of the Covenant is placed within this particular temple in which their false god, a fish god, mighty a god of reproductivity, Amen. Falls in obedience before the Ark of the Covenant. And we see to where that in its fall, the head and the hands of this false idol God has nothing to do but submit itself before the glory of the one true God. Amen. Hallelujah. So it falls. Plagues come upon the Philistines in hopes of escaping God's wrath or God's glories and his wrath, the Philistines move the Ark of the Covenant to one of five different cities on different accounts. Wherever the Ark, or I might add the glory of God was taken, however, the Philistines were still plagued. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The devastation was so immense that the agony of the cries reached to heaven. After months and months of suffering, 
the plague in which God bestowed upon the Philistines. But then Philistine rulers would gather themselves and in their summons would gather the priests and the diviners to decide how to send the glory of God back to Israel. How to send the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel. And notice, they want to honor the God of Israel some way, somehow. And they do so with what you and I would consider to be a guilt offering of five golden rats and tumors. Thus representing the five cities and their rulers affected by these God-given plagues. They prayed God would lift his hand of chastening from off their lives. The ark was then placed upon a new cart. Everyone say with me, a new cart. A new cart with the chest of golden articles sent and drawn by two cows that had just born calves. The calves were put or placed within a pen. The Philistines reasoned among themselves, stating if the cows pull into the territory of the Israelites, away from their lowing young, then we will know that it was God that was responsible. The God of Israel was the one responsible for having plagued our lives. Guess what? The cows did not return to, to their lowing young. God and God's glory was responsible. There is a great deal that takes place today in today's world. I can assure you, God is ultimately in control. Amen. Some people want to argue that God's not responsible for some plagues. God may not be, but he is at times responsible for allowing some adverse circumstances uh, to come our way. If for no other reason, if for no other cause, it is to capture the attention of humanity and helping them to realize uh, that there's no glory that can compare to that of the glory of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And so the ark, the glory, it will say with me, the glory. I don't know about you, but I hunger and thirst for the glory of God. Yes. Amen. It remained undisturbed within the house of one man by the name of Abinadab in the city of Kerzath Jerum, which means of the woods. For 20 years, the Ark of the Covenant lie dormant within the home of Abinadab. Now, it's interesting to note that Israel's first king, Saul, never sought to restore the ark back to that of the nation of Israel. After Saul, however, King David, he sought and longed for the restoration of God's glory, a glory that was not manifested the same way as was with Moses. Not sudden but a restoration process. Amen. Beginning with the prophet Samuel, as is found in 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 3, we see to where it took several years for David to be accepted as king and king over Israel. The people had an extremely difficult and complex time in accepting David as their king. And then when accepted, David as king took Jerusalem by defeating the Philistines and sought to have the Ark of the Covenant restored its right to its rightful place by consulting with captains and by consulting with that of every leader. We read in 1 Chronicles chapter 13 and verse 1. They set the Ark upon a new cart. 2 Samuel. Chapter 6 and verse 3. We read it before you're hearing just moments ago. Everyone say with me again, a new cart. New cart. Amen. A new cart. Where did the Israelites get the idea of a new cart? Where did they get the idea 
It came from none other than the Philistines. The Philistines placed the Ark of the Covenant, a people that were ignorant and unlearned to the rules and knowledgeable to the laws of God. They placed it upon a new cart. But David and the Israelites should have known better, should have known different, but instead would follow after the pattern that was set before them from a world that opposed God. Amen. Church, God has called for you and I to be separate in our style, in our way of worship and glorifying him. We are not to conform to this world in order to witness this world transformed. We are to conform to his image, the image of his dear son, in order to see, amen, the administration of his transforming power at work, not only within our lives, but within the lives of others that should rest wholly upon the church as its example. Praise God. With two men this time, See, they brought the ark from out of Abinadab's house, driving the cart. Then David and all the entire house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments. We read it. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5, it states the same. And then verse 8 of chapter 13 of 1 Chronicles, it tells us they did this with all their might. Now, that sounds familiar because what David did, he did with all his might. But notice, what we do with all our might has to be done in accordance to this book. Hallelujah. Has to be done in accordance to God's rule and rule of law. And so they did it with all their might. Yet look at what happened here in 2 Samuel, chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. The New King James Bible has a reference to the word error as we made reference to it just from the very offset. It's the word irreverence. Another translation that could read like this. God struck him there for not his error, but for his irreverence. You can be ignorantly irreverent and suffer. Two others committed adultery, notice, at the door of the tabernacle where the ark resided. Their irreverence was extremely blatant and far exceeded that of Uzas here within chapter 6 of 2 Samuel who simply placed his hand against the ark to stabilize it which seemingly had the appearance of expressing concern, respect, and reverence. But God's judgment did not seem to be immediate then when the sons of Eli was committing whoredom there at the doorsteps or at the threshold of the tabernacle. The question that may come to us all is why? Why with user and not with them? Could it be that the difference was one was seeking God's glory while the others were attempting to dismiss it? Could it be that God was displaying a long-suffering approach and was waiting and wanting for the ministry that then was, as Eli's son's case, to preserve the glory that was in the process of departing? With Yusa, however, the glory of God was being called upon to return. And with the glory returning, God would want for Israel to have a newfound respect, a newfound sense of honor for this glorious return. Swift judgment could be the key to a stronger and yet devoted respect. The stronger God's manifest the swifter the judgment for irreverence, then maybe there would be honor given 
not to the ark alone, but to God's word. We need an old-fashioned return to God's word. Yeah. Hallelujah. We need to develop a whole new sense of respect and reverence for the love of God, for the glory of God, for him. Oh, yes, we do. Amen. This world needs to, to find for itself a new degree of respect and honor for the glory of God. You know, I, I know I'm being recorded. I, I've given some serious thought to this and I, I contemplate many times since we're on live anymore as to what should be said or what should not be said but you know I, I believe the Lord rebuked me today and said you just preach the word preach the word And that's what I've got to do. The world needs to know. Everyone outside the doors of this, this building, this edifice, need to know. They need to have a respect for God, an old-fashioned respect. I'm going to tell you, the law of God, whereas uh, the carrying of that ark was concerned, did not change. Man tried to change it, but God didn't change. Man still tries to change today, but God hasn't changed. He's still the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he changes not. He still condemns sin. He still, still condemns that which is wrong. So, let's take note of David's response here. And that which would involve his leaders, which were not acquiescent at all. And the people of Israel did not lack passion, it seemed. They did not lack zeal. But then there is this breach. God's responsible for it. And with it, David becomes angry. Let me rephrase this somewhat. God's not totally responsible for it because they were not following the rule of order and of God's law. God seems here, according to man's standards, to be unappreciative of zeal and of David's attempt to honor God by doing all that he knew to do. And yet his best had been judged by God as unacceptable. We should always keep our best in check. But above all, keep our best in line with God's word. David's anger then turns to fear. He became afraid. Those who are afraid oftentimes draw back. And then after some time of reconsideration, withdraw themselves nigh to and toward God as God would draw himself nigh unto them. Amen. Notice, David's, David in time did not allow for his anger nor that of his own personal fear to totally paralyze him from doing what was to be done right later. Uh, hallelujah. So many people want to put blame and censure upon others, upon the preacher, upon the church. And, uh, and uh, they want to put blame elsewhere besides that upon themselves. You are not, no one else is to blame but you yourself for your own ignorance. David had no one to blame but himself. Amen. However, Despite the breach, we see to where David's anger with time subsided. And he would not allow nor permit this to become a barrier that would impede, amen, the ark of the covenant or God's glory from being ushered back into the city of Jerusalem or to that of David's city. 
So David in time would find himself bringing the ark back. He would with such a spiritual wound only allow for a greater counsel of God to protect both God's glory and his feelings. There is no greater caution to be counseled outside that of God's original plan for handling his glory. You know, sometimes the wounds of yesterday tend to cause for you and I to exercise caution. But if there's any caution that's to be exercised, it is to be exercised in God's true counsel. If my best, then it's just as unacceptable. How can the ark, David says, come back to me? Becoming frustrated, becoming angry with the Lord should be quickly affirmed to oneself, not being knowledgeable or understanding of God's ways, which are perfect. God is perfect in every way. You can have zeal and you can have a great deal of passion and yet lack the very thing, the very sustenance that is needful and to temper, which is wisdom and knowledge, and thus cause one a great deal of spiritual perplexity and problems, if not now within the near future. It was neglected responsibility that actually led to David's anger and frustration and thus led to God's judgment. There are the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded that you may fear the Lord your God. This is in Deuteronomy 6, 1 and 2. God gave a clear directive to all mankind to fear him and to know and obey his ways above all else. Above all else. Amen. And to the king, he states in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 18 through 19, that he shall write for himself a copy of the law of this book, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord. Now, we might think up and within ourselves, well, that's for the king. Oh, no. It's for the children of the king. Amen. Amen. Why? So that he would esteem God's ways above man's ideas. Ideology gets humanity into a great deal of trouble. The error of David and his men could have been avoided just as some things can be avoided by us today. Some have asked in the midst of past and now within the present, and that within our unprecedented crisis, where is God in the midst of all of this? Where is God in the midst of all of this? My question I would ask is this. Where was God before this? Was he in your prayer life? Was he in your relationship? Was he in your walk? Hello. Where was God before this? I'm going to tell you, God has never vanished. Oh, he may not can be seen with that of the naked eye. But you could see him if you so desire to. Oh, you may not be able to feel him at times, but if you'll reach out to feel after him, he can be felt. Yes. Hallelujah. I will borrow the quote or question of yet another. Where was God before then and even now? Was he just some mystic figure to you only to be left out and called upon when feasible? He should have been and should remain to be an everyday part of our lives. 
We ought to be breathing God. We ought to be talking God. We ought to be living God. We ought to be sleeping God. My, my, my. Amen. God ought to be involved in every part of our lives. They, that is to say, David and his people gathered to discuss how. But there is no mention of their consulting God and God's written word. Had they read, they would have realized that ones to carry the ark were the Levites. The ark being suspended by poles and carried upon the shoulders of the Levites. As is found in the book of Exodus and Numbers. The lack of knowledge caused, amen, the Israelites to mimic the Gentiles. I'm going to tell you, God has not called for his children to mimic the religious world. Oh, no. This may sound harsh and hard, but God has only called for you and I to be obedient to this book, to be respectful to his glory, to give honor to his name. Come on, let's not bring shame to the name of our great God. Amen. Let's bring honor to that name, magnifying that name through that of our living and our lifestyle in general. Amen, amen. We have the written word to rely upon. The Philistines probably had an excuse. You know, they were ignorant. <laughs> but the Israelites were entrusted with the oracles. Now, in the New Testament, we find where ignorance was winked upon once, but never to be winked at again, more or less. And we see to where that it was ignorance that caused the people during Noah's day to fail on their part to enter into the Ark of the Covenant. Now the term ignorance derives from the word ignore as we have taught in time past. And so the connotation is this. My, my, my. Every one of us got alarms on our phones, haven't we? Even on our video camera up here, this is going off. <laughs> These new fandangle objects can be wearisome. So they chose to be ignorant. Negligence will not be an excuse. Amen? You see, their negligence resulted in the image of God being reduced or relegated to the perception of corruptible man. Methods should never override nor undermine God's principles. God forbid that we make the same error today. And allow what portrait of God we may have, if even it may be one of poor likeness, that it causes for you and I to remove it as is found easier to do than to replace it. What folly to say, since he doesn't look like he did before, then I'll dispose of what view I have of him instead of replace it. God, if he doesn't look like he did before, when you first come to him, it could possibly be that the reason is you don't look like you did before. Now, this sounds like a message of gloom and doom, but that's not it. Because true freedom and true liberty is found in the midst of God's glory. Amen. Let's watch. Let's observe what happens later on. The good news is that David managed to get the ark back. That's good news. When David was made afraid, he still asked the question, how shall the ark of the Lord 
come to me. How am I to get it back to where I am? Amen. And David then carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. It remained there three months, only three months this time, not 20 years. Only three months. It remained there three months, which was probably way too long. Amen. And as the three months it dwelt there within the household of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, we find to where that the household of Obed-Edom was blessed continually day after day. And then when the report came to David how Obed-Edom's household was blessed, I can't not help but feel tonight that the reason why David said there's no longer a need for us to put it off and to put it off any longer. Amen. It's because if the blessings of the Lord could fall well upon the household of Obed Edom, amen, why not the entire household of Israel? And so this became an enticing force with David as David witnessed for himself the need to, to do things the right way. Hallelujah. And so I can't help but feel then that he did a great deal of research. One cannot help but wonder that these blessings were offered as a sign of intentional grace at work, only causing for David to, to pursue God even more. Amen. It's so that God would prove himself faithful giving to God his rightful place of honor, giving to God his rightful place of respect, giving to God his rightful place of reverence. May we see God's glory fill our homes today. May we see God's glory fill USA, fill America once again. May we remain mindful of what will take us back to the place of God's fulfilled glory in both home and country once again. What this country needs is an old-fashioned prayer and through to the oracles of yesteryear and yesterday. Upon the walls of the White House, upon its doorposts or scriptural writings, upon the mantles, if you will, we, we, we find the quotes of presidents of yesterday and, and a great number of, of our politicians as they would make use of, of God's word, quoting God's word, not fearful, not afraid to do so, but it seems as if for the most part, every politician, for the most part, not all of them, are fearful of making use of his name, making use of God's word. You know, it seemed that in the year, I think it was 1960, 1961, Madame O'Hare succeeded, if I'm not mistaken, at convincing the courts that we needed to take prayer from out of the schoolhouses. Bibles were taken from out of the schoolhouses long before that when they were used in time past as a primary textbook uh, within our schools. Hello. And then now we see that to where that there has been a battle not under this administration, but by previous administrations uh, to remove the term God from out of our pledge, uh, the pledge of the allegiance. Honey, we need to pledge our allegiance to God like never before. Amen. Hello. Amen. We need to witness God's glory in this nation. God's glory in our churches. God's glory in our families. God, bring your glory back to our homes. Bring your glory back to our churches. Bring your glory back to this nation. We need an old-fashioned baptism of God's glory like never before. Amen. Send your glory. Send your power. Send your spirit. I need more of it. I need more of it. That's the reason why I'm not afraid to preach what I'm preaching here tonight. Because this is filled with God's glory, Sister Kathy. Hallelujah. It troubles me to know 
that in what we label as the United States of America, to see such a vast amount of division taking place. It is extremely bothersome. Sister Kathy, I thank God for you. I thank God for every white face, every black face, every brown face in this congregation. Oh, yes, I do. Because I want this world to know that I am not a racist except when it comes to that of the human race as a whole. And I want to fight for the freedoms of all and of all mankind. And there's not but one true source of freedom that we as apostolic people need to find within our churches. And that is the freedom for which we have been set free by through that of the power of God's spirit in our midst. Hallelujah. God baptizes with your spirit all over again. Every day that we live, we need a baptism. I pray for our president. I pray for the administration. I pray for justice to be done. I pray that there be a spirit of forgiveness at times. Why? You know, even those that do things that are found to be adverse and contrary to that of my own convictions and beliefs, this book says for me to pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for the enemy. Pray for them that despitefully use you and abuse you. Pray for them that curse you. <laughs> That's hard to do, isn't it? I'm reminded what my grandson said in the back seat of that little Nissan Versa while traveling home one day. Deep in thought. How many of you noticed that at times when Seth gets to be very deep in thought, he just begins to shake a little bit? Deep in thought. I said, a penny for your thoughts. He goes, huh? I think that might have been the first time he ever heard that. I said, what you thinking about, son? He said, Barry Paul, God's a strange God. Mm -mm. Seven years of age, strange God. Well, what makes you say that, son? Well, <laughs> he says we're to pray for our enemies. <laughs> That's a hard thing to do. That's mighty strange, according to man's calculations. And you know, he cho chooses unique and strange ways of just accomplishing victory. You know, when, they call, when he called for the nation of Israel to march seven times around the walls of Jericho, I mean, what army <laughs> fights that way? I mean, this is a seven-year-old's way of thinking. I said, son, you're right. He is kind of strange, isn't he? And if I remember correctly, I, I put it to him like this. The book says, his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are far beyond that of our own. Let's just let God be God. Let's get his glory back to us. Let's get his glory back to the apostolics. I'm asking for the musicians to come up here if they will. Watch this. While on the way back, we witnessed David behaving with a demeanor and a way so unlike that of any form of royalty. 
he stripped himself of his royal clothing. And he took upon himself that of the garment of a servant, linen cloth. And he began to dance before the ark of the covenant with all his, you know what? He was doing it the right way this time. Doing it the right way this time. Nothing just inadvertently or haphazardly took place that would take the life of yet another one of his own because it was done the right way. And with every seventh step, Brother Jordan, we see to where that he would offer up a sacrifice unto the Lord. And then after that, would continue to march and dance before the Lord again. Oh, hear me, church. Let's do it the right way. Let's all stand. Healing. We need some healing. If not healing of body, we need some healing within our spirits. I have never witnessed so much vitriol and hatred taking place in and among the American people in all my life like I see it displayed today. And perhaps the media tends to fabricate some and even magnify it more than what, it's, what it really is. There's a good possibility that that be the case. Brother Long, when I think of the masses that are less privileged and blessed than we ourselves here in America, like the blessed souls of them in Africa, today I was meditating and I got I began to think. You know, it seemed like there's been a lot upon me here of late, and. I got to thinking, not so much, Sister Kathy, not so much. And it was like the Lord spoke to me and said, you ungrateful individual, you. Anyone feel like the Lord ever talks to you that way at times? And Brother George, I said, you're right, Lord, you're right. You're so right. The problem is, is you're right all the time. That's not really a problem. It's a good thing. Because if him being right, I can become right. Because if God being just and right, David became right, Sister Long. How can I get the glory? How can I get the ark back to me? <laughs> it's our new grandson back there. You know something preacher nothing we say or do is good enough for you around here that's not it it's not it at all I just want you to be reminded Sister Libby our reason for being here is not just for the sake of self alone it's for others the others are depending upon us. They're depending upon this true source of freedom and liberty of which you and I have come to experience for ourselves. Why don't we expect them to receive the same spirit of liberty that we have encountered? Look to your neighbor, smile, and say, this is so right. This is so right.
Why is it? Because he's right. He's right. Freedom for all. I want people to experience this freedom. My daughter came to me moments ago. Pardon me for making reference to her and to you. She said, everything okay, Dad? It's okay. No, no, is it okay? I said, it's okay. Is there anything I can do? I said, no. Not at all. Because what has to be accomplished has to be settled within for myself. No one else can take care of that. And Sister Anna, I knew what I was going to preach tonight. And you, you're talking about preaching oneself under conviction. I've been preaching myself under conviction. You can't take care of what's here. And I can't unless I'm willing to yield it to the Lord. And so you know what my intent is here tonight? It's to experience freedom before I leave this place. I'm going to be liberated. You say, preacher, you mean you have problems? Oh, yes, I have problems. My biggest and largest problem, Brother Long, is with myself. Sing it. Sing it. I need you, Lord. I want your glory. I want your glory. Less of me and more of you. Less of me.
not just reflect upon the past and upon what yesteryear and yesterday may have brought. Amen. For the latter rain will be greater. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. The latter rain will be greater. Appreciate this church family and body. Appreciate you being here tonight. And for no other reason for putting up with me. If I'm the only human one here tonight, you forget me. But I don't I I don't think I'm the only human here tonight. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in the fear of the Lord. And may his good grace be with you in departure. So depart.